Um, I want to take a very short series to talk to you about some things that, uh, honestly, no one ever asked me advice for, no one ever confesses is a sin in their life, and no one asks for teaching publicly about. So I'd like to take just a, a couple of Sundays and deal with something I think is really important, and yet we often don't think about it in those terms. And we're going to talk about provision. If I were to ask you what the really powerful forces at work in your life were, you would probably list some things like this, the power of love. I mean, how incredible is this force in our lives to help us declare our feelings and make unbelievable commitments? Or how about the power of hope, which isn't denial, it's not refusing to accept what's happening, it's just refusing to believe that this is the end, that there is something else that can yet happen and it's better than what's going on right now. Or the power of vision, that, that ability to see beyond the current and see potential, what could be if we would work together. Or the power of community that connects us to others in ways that breathes life into what would otherwise be a suffocating reality of selfishness and isolation. But what I will tell you is there's another force that can actually corrode our love, it can dissolve our hope, it can extinguish our vision, and it can divide community, and it's called the power of interest. And the way it works against us is when we are in debt. And once you have a debt, you will carry a burden every day and night until you have met its ever-increasing demands. It is constantly working against you. It has no sympathy for your situation. If you ever fail to meet its demands, it will take everything it can away from you. So I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes on how debt restricts your life. And the first is, is that it can enslave you. In the ancient world, that was literally true. If you couldn't pay your debt, you became the servant of someone else. But in today's world, we likewise become enslaved. Maybe there's, you're working a job that you hate, and the job that you love becomes available, but you'll make a little bit less money, and because you can't afford to exercise that option, you have to keep the job you don't like. Well, who's in control of that decision? The answer is debt. So this is what it says in Proverbs 22. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, I think uh, counselors today, financial counselors and Christian financial counselors, will tell you that not all debt is the same. There is wise debt and unwise debt. For example, if you have a mortgage on a home, that can be a wise debt. It may even prove to be an investment over time if you take good care. However, a, recrawl, a revolving credit card debt is not usually considered a wise debt. Uh, a mortgage, 30-year mortgage on a home right now is about four and a quarter percent. If you're taking out a 15-year mortgage, it's about three and a half percent. A credit card uh, current interest rates right now average about 17 percent. And what you have to realize is in the Bible, in the Old Testament, no one was ever allowed to charge more than 12% because that was considered immoral, unethical, and illegal. And we carry credit cards in our pockets right now, which break all of those laws every single day. Not only can it uh, enslave us, the power of debt can increase pressure that God never intended for you to carry. Uh, we worry and we become anxious. We just can't shake these feelings that uh, just keep boring into our hearts, into our minds. We can't afford to take a sick day because you might lose your job. You, you can't take a vacation because you can't afford the vacation. And even if you could afford the vacation, you can't afford the time off of work because you're going to lose some income. This pressure is just never ending. And it just keeps pop, uh, just piling onto us. And so God says, that will do that to you. Another thing is it can reduce your capacity to experience joy. Uh, even when something good happens, you can't enjoy it fully because you know the debt still hangs over your head. And uh, it never goes away until it's completely paid off. And it can keep you from being generous. There are things you want to do to help someone else or to help make a difference. You just have no capacity to follow up on it. Your heart's in the right place. You just are not able to act on it. 
And, uh, and when that happens, we usually feel guilty, too. So when you, when you want to do something and you can't do something, you usually feel guilty about it. So uh, the reason that um, debt has such power over us is because it's based on a set of systems that take advantage of what wind up being character flaws inside of us. And I know this is a risky part of the conversation to go into, but I just want you to hang with me for a few minutes. I promise the news by the end of today will be incredibly good news for you. But unwise debt can reveal some character flaws. And we often think of character flaws as something that God is offended by or embarrassed by. Uh, if you've been a parent, you've probably seen your kid do something at some point in a public space in which you hope no one made the connection that they belong to you and because uh, they were just embarrassing you. And sometimes we think that we're like that with God. That's not what's going on. When God identifies character flaws, it's not because he's embarrassed by or offended at it. It's because he knows that those flaws make us susceptible to certain traps and certain systems that are designed to take advantage of us. And so God, in his word, tries to warn us about these things. For example, the inability to be content is a character flaw. We're just not happy with what we have. We just always have to have something bigger, better, brighter, faster, newer. And uh, this is what it says in Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be, what's the next word? Content. What are we supposed to be content with? With what you have. Because God said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Uh, we seem to have a hard time saying enough on anything other than painful things. I mean, uh, we'll sit down and, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going through a difficult, painful experience, you don't want it to go through it anymore. When is it going to end? But we never seem to think that way about what is too much for me to have. Do you remember about a year ago when the mega lotto jackpot went to over a billion dollars? Not one single person did I ever hear say, that is so much money, I'm going to sit this one out. Nobody said that. People were saying things like this to me. Pastor, I don't usually do this, but it's so much money. <laughs> and so they just went and bought a lottery ticket. So what are we supposed to do about this? We find ourselves not being content, not being able to say enough. And then there's an inability to discern between wants and needs. That's a character flaw. There are things that we need. There are things that we want. If you're a parent, you've already had this conversation multiple times with your children. Uh, you know, I need, and, and actually they don't need. I, uh, when my son was a lot younger, we went to an electronic store, and there was a giant screen TV, and he was standing in front of it. He was close to it, and a football game was on. And, and they threw a pass, and he literally watched the pass like this. And he turned around and saw me standing there, Dad, and he said, Dad? I said, yeah. He said, we need this TV. And I said, we, we don't need this TV. I said, first of all, we lived in a really small house. It was so small that when my son sat on one side of the living room and my daughter's boyfriend sat on the other side of the living room, their feet would touch. That's how tiny it was. So to fit a TV that size in that room was not possible. And I told him, even if we could, we'd have to set up lawn chairs in the front lawn and watch it through the front window of the house. And this is what he told me. He said, Dad, you know that feeling when you look at a screen and it feels too big? I said, yeah. He said, that's a good feeling. That's what, <laughs> that's what that is. We can't tell the difference between what we want and what we need. We, because... Because there are things that make life easier or more enjoyable, we want them, but we can turn them into needs very quickly. This is what it says in 1 Timothy 6. If we have food and clothing, we will be, what's the next word? Content. Content. Um, and yet, most of us can have food and clothing and shelter and transportation, and we're not content because there's always something more. And then we have a hard time being patient. It's a character flaw. We just don't trust God to provide what we desire. So we feel like we have to take matters into our own hands. And when we do that, it usually involves one of two things, either breaking rules or going into debt. And it's not that the thing we desire is a bad thing, and it's not that God's not going to give it to us. It's just we don't want to wait for his timing on that. 
Then another character flaw is coveting. Coveting turns all of life into a competition. When you see someone else have something that's really wonderful and, and, and enjoyable, it is really hard in our culture for us to say, I am so happy for them. What we usually say is, I've got to get one of them. That's how we think about it. And we turn all of life into a competition where we're trying to either keep up or outdo everyone else. Why can't we just let someone else have more than we do? Why is that so hard for us? Now, this talk already this morning, you're probably sitting here and you're starting to feel a little bit anxious and maybe a little bit guilty and possibly a little bit alarmed. And you may be afraid. You know what? It's too late. I've already surrendered too much to the power of debt. And so now I can't even listen to anything that he's got to say. Just hang on. I promise you. Really good news today. Just stay with me. What I, the first thing I would say is, don't feel guilty. God already paid the price for your guilt in full. This is not about guilt. This is not about trying to pile on or make you feel bad. It's about trying to discover ways that help us get out of the traps that we are in. So I'm going to show you a little case study this morning. I looked online and, and I'm told that the average household debt in the United States of America is, does anybody want to guess? It's $16,000. Now, some of you here are, this morning are going, that much? I'm doing good. And maybe you are, maybe you're not. And this is not an encouragement for you to, to become average. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> and you might be sitting here this morning, $16,000. Yeah, I wish, because you've got so much more. And, and this is not about making you feel bad. But let's take a look at something this morning. So can you see the screen? This is a, this is a family that has uh, multiple credit cards, uh, one to a department store where they got some furniture, one to an electronic store where they got that really big high-definition television with the, all the surround sound. And so the total amount that they have uh, taken out is $14,500. Now, I want you to see something here, all right? If you look at the first credit card, uh, it says that they, they borrowed $1,200 on that at 12%. 12% is actually a pretty decent rate on a credit card. And their minimum monthly payment is $48, okay, $48. Now, if you look at the last line, you will notice how many months it will take for them to pay back the $1,200. And that last column, it is 125 months. That's a lot. Some of you might not live 125 months, right? 125 months. And on that $1,200 that they borrowed, in addition to paying that back, they will also pay $646 in interest. Let's look at the next line. MasterCard, they borrowed $2,300 on that. The interest rate is almost 15%. The minimum monthly payment is $75. All right? If you look at the last column, how many months does it take them to pay that off? 195 months. Now, how can this be? And there's a trick. That, that credit agencies use. And that is that as you're paying it, as you're paying it down, they will send you a statement that says, you don't have to pay $75 this month. You only pay $73 this month. Why do they reduce the rate? Because they love you? Because they, 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 they want to give you a few extra dollars in your pocket at the end of the month? Oh, no, 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 no. They're not being nice. They want you to pay longer because the longer you pay, the more interest you bring to bear in this debt. And that's what they're after. So they will keep reducing the principal as you go so that you keep paying more interest as you go. So let's look at this last line. If we did this through all the credit cards, this is what we have. The total amount that they borrowed is $14,500. Right? The current payment amount that they are making every single month right now, what, what is it? $430. That's what they're paying every month. And they're going to pay back the $14,500 plus $15,237 in interest for a grand total just under $30,000. How long will it take to do this? $200. And 92 months, in case you, you wonder about the math, that's 24 years. 24 years. 
You can have a baby and they can be out of the house before you pay this thing off. And I know some of you are sitting here going, yeah, they're still in the house and it's been longer than that. But that's, that's another message. So. Okay. so what if I were to tell you, and what I'm going to talk about this morning, when you hear it, some of you are going to go, yeah, there's, he's trying to, this, this doesn't add up. What I will tell you is there's a way to not pay a dollar more every month than you're paying right now and significantly pay that debt off faster and eliminate the majority of the interest. And you don't have to pay a dollar more than you're paying right now. And when I tell people this, they often don't believe me. They think that this is some kind of fuzzy math. No, the fuzzy math is on the way it's set up. They keep reducing the amount that you have to pay each month to keep you paying longer. And 24 years into this, you will finally be able to say, well, we paid off our credit card debt. And so I'm going to give you four rules. If you will live by these four rules, you will pay your credit card debt off much faster and you will eliminate most of the interest. Rule number one, commit to no new debt. You can't get ahead by keep going behind. The more in debt you get, the more in debt you are. So you just have to be able to draw a line in the sand. If that means using a, uh, an older style phone, if it means driving an older model car, whatever that is, you just decide no more new debt. Second, pay the same amount each month until all the unsecured debts are paid. So the credit card companies will tell you, you can pay a little less and you'll like that because now that gives you more money each month. But if, if you keep paying less to them, you keep paying longer to them and they make more money. So even when on that first credit card and it's $48 and they say, okay, now you only have to pay $44, you still pay $48. I'm gonna show you what a difference that makes in just a minute, okay? Uh, but um, third, third rule. Arrange your debts with the shortest payoff time at the top of your list and the longest payoff time at the bottom of your list. Now, I know some people will tell you that you should do it by interest rate and the highest interest rate at the top and the lowest interest rate at the bottom. And what I will tell you is, is that we have kind of uh, an unhealthy emotional attachment to our finances and our debt, and it's better to get a win under your belt sooner. And the difference is not that much by using this strategy. So the shortest payoff at the top of the list and the longest payoff at the bottom of the list. And the last rule is this. As one debt is paid, take that payment and redirect it to the next debt in line. So when you finally paid off the first credit card, you don't say, oh great, now I've got $48 extra to spend every month. No, no, you take that and you add it to the next line, which was $75, so now it's 48 and 75. And let me show you what a difference that this makes. And I know you're not gonna believe me, you can check out the numbers for yourself. Have a financial counselor look at it, all right? So, Visa card number one, if all you do is just make the $48 payment every month, you never decrease it. You ready for this? Look all the way over to the end. How many months does it take to pay it off? 29 instead of 125. You can pay that off in 29 months instead of 125 months just by refusing to reduce the amount each month you're paying on it. Right? Uh, look at this next one, MasterCard. When you, when you take that $48 and you add it to the $75 after, on that 30th month, you will be able to pay that credit card off in 35 months. Now, let's just look back. Originally, that was 195 months. And you're going to pay it off in 35. And by the way, the amount of interest that you will have paid on that loan is $600 instead of $2,055. How is this possible? The systems of our world are designed to take advantage of our character weaknesses. And if we can bring even a small amount of discipline, four simple rules, I will not go into any more debt. I will not pay anything less on my debt than I'm paying right now. 
when one debt is, is completed, then I will redirect those resources to the next debt. If we can keep simple rules like that, I want you to see what happens over time. Look down here. You still pay back the $14,500. You never paid more than $430 in any month. The total amount of interest that you're paying back now is $4,711. You're saving over $10,500 in interest alone. Now, why am I talking about this? Because that's your money. You worked for it. You showed up. You did what you needed to do to earn it. God gave you the opportunity, the skills, in order to bring that money home. That was God's provision in your life. And there are systems in our world that are designed to take away from you what God has given to you. And I think you should be enjoying your money instead of some corporate system that is designed just to get it because they can give you something now instead of waiting a little bit longer. Does that make sense? So how long does this take? 45 months. Same debt, and instead of 24 years, it's 45 months. By the way, if you took that same $430 and you put it into an investment or retirement account over the same amount of time that they want you to pay that off, by the time you get to 24 years, you will have almost a quarter of a million dollars in your account. That's the law of interest working for you instead of against you. God provides for us. But often the way we manage that provision winds up injuring our capacity. Why am I talking about this now? Because Christmas is coming. And so many of us just want, we want to see our children smile with such a great big smile. Or we want to see our spouse smile with such a great big smile. And you might get the smile you desire, but you are going to be miserable for the next 24 years paying this thing off. It's not worth it. And how many times do we spend more than we should on Christmas just because we feel guilty about not being there for our family? Well, you're going to be there even less because you're probably going to have to take on another part-time job in order to try to pay this stuff off. It's just, it destroys community. It breaks down relationships. It dashes our hopes. And it makes us frustrated, especially when, when we're in debt. You're still paying on that gift you bought for someone, and they've already broken it, or they don't appreciate it, or they're not taking good care of it. What do we do? We get frustrated. With, hey, I pay, hey, I pay good money for that. You better take good care of that. No, you're still paying good money for that. And that's part of why you're so angry about it. We need to be a little bit wiser about these things. So instead of 24 years, you can pay off all $14,550 and instead of paying $15,237 in interest, you can pay only $10,500 in interest. And when you're all done, you'll actually be enjoying the provision of God in your life instead of some system who's taken advantage of you. God provides for us. He's very generous. And he doesn't mind that we enjoy what he's provided. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, once again, uh, just so you know, the purpose of this talk is not to inspire guilt or to make you feel less than if you find yourself behind the eight ball in a debt situation. The purpose of the talk is to let you know there actually is an accelerated way out and you can be free. Uh, by the way, these same principles apply on mortgage and car loans. You, you can pay more money on your principal and it reduces the amount of interest you pay over time by thousands and thousands of dollars. And God trusted you with that money because he wanted you to enjoy it. He wanted your family to enjoy it. He wanted, when you felt moved with generosity, that you would have something to release into someone else's hands to make a difference. And so the wisdom of his word helps us to be able to do that. And I, 
I just want to say this. Some people are always anxious when they hear a pastor talk about money because they think it's all about an offering. I didn't talk about offering one time today. This is not about getting more money in our church. This is about you enjoying the provision of God more in your life. So, Father, um, strengthen those parts of our character that seem weak and give us wisdom to discern some of those traps that are set before us. And, and if we find ourselves under the incredibly crushing weight of debt in our lives right now, would you please give us a spark of hope that it will not always be this way and there's a path out that is much faster than we imagined it to be. I thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand this morning.